Welcome to everyone joining me today. I am Dr. Stephen Lewis, a pianist, composer, and private music teacher living in Portland, Oregon. I hope everyone watching this video today is healthy and safe during this extraordinary time. I would like to thank Susan Todd, Selena Manson, and the OMTA for asking me to present this webinar to all of you. I will be sharing with you my experience in teaching lessons remotely via the internet, something I've already been doing for several years. My hope is to translate my experience into concrete advice that can help you to also teach your students remotely. If you enjoyed my video today, please consider subscribing to my channel on YouTube. I plan on continuing to post videos on teaching, the piano, music in general, along with select performances of mine. In today's webinar, we will begin with this pre-recorded video. After the video is completed, then I will be online at our Zoom meeting where I can help answer your questions and facilitate discussion. You can find the link to our Zoom meeting in the description below this video. While watching this video, YouTube allows for you to add live chat messages. Please feel free to do so. It can help me prepare to answer questions that come up during this video. In this video, I will describe necessary and ideal equipment for successful remote lessons, along with ideas on proper setup for that equipment, and applications to use for video chatting. I will also address how your students and their families should set up on their end. Finally, I will talk about some adjustments to teaching approaches and methods that I find helpful when teaching remotely rather than in person. First, let's look at necessary equipment for teaching remote lessons. Of the four primary options for video chatting, that is being a laptop, a smartphone, a tablet, or some kind of desktop computer, the most flexible is a laptop. It's important that the laptop have a built-in video camera or that you attach a decent external video camera to your laptop. A tablet, whether an iPad or some other brand, is also an excellent computer to use for remote lessons. I highly recommend the largest screen size available as it is the most useful for teaching and for music in general. I'll be including the outline to my recent Nellie Tholen talk the iPad as teaching tool to give you other ideas about how to use an iPad or other tablet in your teaching and musical life. Tablets will need a tripod or other holder to attain the ideal angles and vantage point for the camera. Most tablet holders will direct the camera, camera at too high an angle, missing the keyboard and hands entirely. This is because tablet holders are designed to be placed on a desk or a table, and to look straight up at the speaker. They are not designed to look straight ahead. The tripod and tablet holder attachment for the tripod are necessary to hold the tablet at a good angle safely. Propping a tablet up on books or in any other unsecured way is very dangerous to the tablet. Less ideal are smartphones and desktops. Smartphones are simply too small. A crucial component to remote lessons are screens large enough to see your students' hands clearly. Notice in the photo here how much smaller an iPhone 5S is than a 12.9 inch iPad. In addition, smartphones can be more difficult to position for the correct angles. However, in a pinch, they can be used to provide audio through their speakerphone function if the audio in Skype or Zoom for whatever reason is not working. Desktops are also difficult to manage since they tend to be stuck in one spot, often far from the piano, and the various cables necessary to hook up webcams and headphones will be a trip bait hazard, dangerous to equipment and humans alike. In addition, if the desktop is not near to your piano, you won't be able to see your student on the screen. However, if you already have a desktop in a good position next to your piano, then it could be a more viable option. Headphones, or earbuds, are crucial to high-quality remote lessons. Audio quality is far superior if both the teacher and student wears them, and headphones prevent audio feedback and an annoying echo effect that can occur. 
make sure that whatever headphones or earbuds you use are either wireless or have long, flexible cords. Pulling a tap, uh, laptop or tablet onto the floor is a real danger with corded headphones. I use Sony studio monitors, pictured here in the top photo, with a flexible and extendable cord that allows me to move freely up to about 10 feet from my iPad without worrying about pulling it over. When I teach remote lessons, I actually use both my iPad and my MacBook Pro. I use the iPad, seen here on a tripod, to stream the video chat while I use my laptop to create my bespoke practice sheets for my students using Microsoft OneNote. While this is an expensive setup, it does provide for much more flexibility and functionality during lessons. However, if you only have one of these available, it is still very feasible to teach remote lessons. When it comes to the setup, it works best to imitate how you would normally be positioned at an in-person lesson. You should place your laptop or tablet to the side of the piano, either side will work, so that the camera can see the keyboard, your hands, and your torso and face. In my experience, it's usually not possible to get the feet and pedals into the frame and still see everything else well, so prioritize the hands, keys, torso, and face. It is very helpful to have someone else aid you in your setup, at least until you get used to where everything needs to go. There are a number of apps for video chatting. It is important to make the best choice for remote lessons. Many video chatting apps are specifically designed for the spoken human voice and have software that tries to eliminate noise. Unfortunately, the piano itself here counts as noise. There are also apps that give more control over how the sound works, though these apps with the most control are also the hardest to learn and to use. The best apps overall, in my experience, are Skype and Zoom, with Skype by far the easiest to use for both uh, teacher and student. It is also extremely widespread, so it is likely your students and their families already have an account on Skype. Skype offers the best basic balance of ease of use with quality of sound. Skype includes audio setting control that let the piano sound be heard more clearly. In Skype, you can also use text chatting with your students during the lesson and send them files such as annotated score files, pieces, or even audio recordings during their lesson. Skype allows you to schedule meetings in advance, and you can even record audio and video messages for your students in Skype, which can be convenient for short demonstrations of pieces or techniques. These can be recorded at any time, not just during your lesson. Zoom, an app that is growing greatly in popularity due to the COVID-19 pandemic, is a video chat option that has much finer control over the audio settings. It is more complicated to learn than Skype, and proper setup includes adjusting the audio settings on both ends, yours and the students. This is often serves as a barrier. Zoom, like Skype, offers useful functions like text chatting, sharing files, scheduling in advance, and recording messages. You can also record your entire lesson through Zoom so that your students can access it later on if they want. Two other common video chat apps include FaceTime and Google Duo. FaceTime is extremely easy to use for Mac users, but its sound quality is the worst for piano lessons of all the apps that I know. Google Duo I have not tried, but its audio settings appear quite limited, which does not bode well for transmitting piano sounds over the ether. To use Skype, First, you'll need to download it if you do not already have it. You can search for the Skype download on a search engine like Google or DuckDuckGo, go to Microsoft's website to locate Skype, or follow this link, and I'll make the PowerPoint slides available to everybody who would like them. After installing Skype, you'll need to create an account. This is a free account. If you already have a Microsoft account, 
then you will use that account and will not need to create a new one. Next, you will need to search for your students' contact info or have them add you. Be in good touch with all your students in case they need to follow these steps to create their own Skype accounts as well. I highly recommend running a trial call with a friend or family member to test out all of your settings in Skype, as well as your setup at your piano. Please make certain that this person is not on your same home internet connection, as this will greatly skew the results of the video. And finally, one common option in Skype under video settings that is worth changing is the blur background option. This can often be nice if you're having a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody. However, for piano lessons, you need to turn that off so the camera can show the student's hands clearly. For the student's home setup, it is best if they follow the same format as yours. Laptops or tablets are ideal. The camera should take in their hands, the keyboard, their torso, and their face. Headphones or earbuds with flexible cords or wireless headphones or earbuds are important for safety, audio quality, and also to create a sense of privacy. Many students do not want their parents or siblings around for their lessons, but nowadays everyone is stuck at home. Headphones will allow for the student to feel more separated from their surroundings, which will improve the quality of their lessons, especially if other family members need to be in the same room with them. Finally, your students will need the same video chatting app as you are using. Make sure the parents are on hand at first to help with the setup. Remember, many young people need help with technology. It is a myth that the young know these things quote unquote naturally. Having a parent on hand to help with the first lesson setup will help get your lessons going much sooner and much more smoothly. For many of us, teaching in-person lessons has become a series of habits, hopefully mostly good. Teaching remotely can at first be jarring, as many of our common habits and actions, such as writing on student scores, guiding their wrists or fingers, moving around our studio, and even noticing subtle indicators of how our students are feeling and reacting, like body language and minute facial expressions, are no longer possible or much harder over the internet. The quality of the video, even on a large screen, can often make these things difficult to notice. Here are some of my observations about what adjustments to make to teaching methods when, taught, when lessons are taught over the internet. It is harder to notice subtle cues that we rely upon for teaching. We can tell a lot about how our students are feeling, what they are absorbing, what we need to explain again, and if we need to redirect their attention. By noticing their facial expression, their body language, many subtle things that are easy to see in person. In remote lessons, we need to be more explicit in asking questions to our students to gauge where they are in these areas. Sometimes these questions are the kinds that would seem somewhat testy or exasperated in person, but online are necessary for clarity. For instance, I find myself asking much more often, did you understand what I just said? Asking, did you hear me clearly, or did I cut out, can also help bridge the occasional internet-related interference or slowdown. Teaching technique can be a challenge online. We so often interact with our students physically, guiding their wrists, helping them find the keys for beginners, or demonstrating alongside them at the bench. Online, we must rely more upon demonstrating technique visually over the video, which is part of why having a camera at the correct angle and vantage point is so crucial. We must also develop precise, clear, evocative language for conveying technique verbally. For instance, I have a student learning box two-part a minor invention right now. To help him navigate the tricky counterpoint, I asked him to picture two monkeys swinging acrobatically around each other on vines and branches in the jungle. This helped him immensely with those tricky passages for better technique and accuracy. I probably would not have used that imagery if we had a lesson in person because I tend to work more through demonstration. However, these experiences of teaching remote lessons are, are helping remind me the power of imagery. For remote lessons though, it's absolutely vital. So you might want to start thinking about 
um, interesting, evocative, precise ways you can describe various kinds of piano technique. Teaching tone and musicality over the internet can also be difficult. I find it necessary to rely more on my students to listen to themselves and give me their own feedback of how they sound in the room where they are. This is due to the flattening of sound over the internet, even under the best of conditions, making it very hard to hear finer gradations in dynamics, pedaling, sonority, shaping of phrases, and voicing of chords. I also spend more time playing demonstrations for my students, explicitly describing what I am about to show them. For example, to help them voice chords correctly, I will tell them exactly how I'll voice these chords. Then as I demonstrate through playing, I over-exaggerate it so it'll be heard by them over the connection. Beyond that, I am also finding many new, clearer, and more evocative ways of describing sound to help my students with issues of tone and musicality. In online lessons, we must either rely on the student to write everything down for us, or we will need to send our students annotated scores after each lesson. I find the former easier to manage, and it helps my students develop a better understanding of the score and how to navigate around it through the very precise instructions I give them to locate various areas where I want them to write things down. Just like with technique, musicality, and tone, it is crucial to be extremely specific in describing to our students what and where to write. For example, it is too vague to say, mark that B-flat with four even though in person this could work well combined with a gesture or a look from us to show the students um, where we mean. Instead, in remote lessons, we should say something more like, in measure seven, write the number four above the B-flat in the right hand, the B-flat that is the second 16th note inside of the third beat. This might seem like quite a, a bit too much information, but over the internet, it's really important to be that precise in detail to help students write things down in the correct spot. As I mentioned earlier, the other alternative would be to send your students annotated scores after each lesson with all the updates to fingering, expressive markings, reminders, all that kind of stuff. For practice segments in music, you can also ask your student to mark them in, into the score themselves, again, being extremely precise or again, send them a PDF of practice segments. I do this each week for my students by sending them a specially made practice sheet using Microsoft OneNote. You can read more about that and other ways in which you can make use of a tablet, if you have one, in the notes from my talk on the iPad as teaching tool. For adapting writing work, such as theory, composition, music history, and for listening assignments, I typically find these types of content don't work as well in online piano lessons as they do in person. Instead, I will typically send assignments as PDFs to my students to work on during the week. I ask them to send me a scan of their completed work before my lesson with them so I can look it over. I also plan to create more videos for content that many of my students are learning about such as how to play scales correctly, spelling chords and scales, practicing strategies or information on pieces or composers' lives. It is relatively easy to make your own videos, especially if you already have the setup described above for teaching remote lessons. Laptops and tablets can record video and make editing it relatively easy with programs like iMovie or even QuickTime. In addition, um, those of you who have access or are members of the Multnomah County Library, they have an online resource that's simply amazing. It's called lynda.com, it's lynda with a Y, and it's a repository of a whole bunch of professional level tutorials on how to use various computer programs, such as Adobe Creative Suite and uh, sound editing programs, video editing programs, Microsoft Office programs, pretty much any program you can think of. And it's available all for free through our library. And if you're interested either in making your own videos or designing better handouts for your students 
or even taking some courses on how to run a small business, which technically we, I guess we all are, um, then this is an amazing resource. I think normally it would cost $45 a month if you bought it individually. So especially now that you might have more time on your hands, um, that can not just help you with your teaching and your career, but also give you some something really fun and engaging to do. So again, that's lindo.com, and I'll include a link down in the video description for you to check that out more. Once you're used to teaching via Skype or Zoom, it is easy to expand into hosting master classes or syllabus exams online using those same services. Um, oftentimes those are run pretty much like a lesson, so you could have the teacher or the um, examiner on one end of the call and the student on the other end. And you can even set up multi-person calls if you want to be there as well. Um, for studio recitals, Zoom can work really well as long as the event is 40 minutes or less in length. Um, in Zoom, you need a paid account in order to host a meeting with more than three people for longer than 40 minutes. And the rates are fairly high, so I recommend instead trying to keep things to the 40 minute limit. However, there's, there's no real limit to the number of people who can be in that meeting. I also recommend having students pre-record their performances. This is an alternative um, idea for hosting studio recitals. Instead of having them perform live, you'd have students pre-record their performance, audio and video, and then you can collect all of the videos and then compile them, say, as a YouTube playlist. Or if you have some video editing chops, you can combine them into one video file to post on YouTube or Vimeo or, some, or even on Facebook Live. And then at a set time, you can have everybody tune in to watch your studio recital together, much like you're doing right now with this video. This um, method prioritizes having much higher video quality, higher audio quality, and there's much lower risk of a slow or faulty internet connection uh, marring people's performances because the video would already be a complete file and people could watch it again if they like and it just would be more stable. However, having a live event can sometimes feel better for studio morale and cohesion and everything, so both are good options. I hope this video has been helpful to you and sparked your own interesting ideas. We are fortunate to live in a time where technology allows us to run music lessons remotely quite successfully, and the technology and approaches I've talked about today are only scratching the surface of what is possible. I encourage you all to experiment and be imaginative to find what works best for you and your studio. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more by me in the future talking about music, the piano, teaching, and my performances, then please click the subscribe button to follow me. Now we'll switch over to our Zoom session, the link is below in the description of this video, where I will be there live to help answer questions you may have and to join in the discussion. Thanks so much for watching.